Today's talk, Nature's Odd Couples, a study in symbiotic relationships. Nature can be rough. Uh, I want to give you a few examples. There's many large fish. They have a need to keep their teeth clean so that they don't get infected and end up falling out. You have situations where uh, the teeth are dirty, but they don't have dental hygienists. Crocodiles have a similar need. And then uh, with regard to various uh, animals that have ticks or parasites, they're in their ears, they're in their nostrils, you know, in their nose, and, but they don't have hands or fingers to pick them out. And then some animals have poor eyesight and really need a good faithful lookout. Some small animals would really benefit from having a big strong friend to provide protection, a bodyguard if you will, because they're kind of weak. And some animals just do better in every way in their life. Shelter, protection, food, just by having a mutual friend. We can all use a mutual friend, right? And then imagine if you had a digestive system that couldn't digest the food that you ate. You know, you take something like a, a termite. He could eat a two by four and starve to death because he couldn't digest it. And so there's, there's these various situations that occur in nature. And I believe God saw fit to allow these various oddities in nature to basically accomplish a couple of things. One, throw a wrench in the works of the whole idea of survival of the fittest because symbiotic relationships, which simply means living together, flies in the face of symbiotic relationships. And so God in his wisdom, his design, I call it creative flair. Uh, that's interesting oddities that he did just because he can. <laughs> He's instilled in different animals outrageous and helpful relationships. Relationships is the key here. Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal nature, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what he has made, so that men are without excuse. I want to begin by defining some of the key words in the study, uh, nature's odd couples. Symbiosis, or symbiotic relationships, again, comes from the Greek symbiosis meaning living together there there's several you might say flavors or types of symbiotic relationships the first one and the one that's most common is mutualism that's where both animals involved receive a mutual benefit from the relationship they both are blessed from the relationship if you will and then you have what's known as commensalism this is more of a one-sided affair you have relationships in life like this that's unfortunate one animal gets all the benefits and sometimes in a really a major way, I mean, they'd have a hard time actually existing without the benefit. But the other part of the relationship, the other half of the couple gets nothing. But the key here under commensalism, but they're not damaged, they're not hurt. This is in sharp contrast to the third example, which is parasitism or parasites, simply where one animal benefits at the harm of the other one. The other one, not only, it's not just, you know, okay, neutral, they're actually negatively impacted. It's a serious problem. Next, I'd like to give you some of the examples of these three types of symbiotic relationships. Full disclosure, there is actually a fourth type when you look at the actual catalog of information. And again, some of this I've only learned in the last three months. I had to go and do a, like a deep dive, and it's, it is so compelling to see how many of these relationships and so many of these dynamics that exist in nature scream of a creator, could not have come about by any kind of accidental mumbo jumbo, also known as you know, Big Bang or whatever else you want to call it. Wouldn't happen. And I've often said, I, you know, I do some ministry at the boot camp and I'll often tell the guys, you know, they got free will, they can choose to believe whatever they want. I go in there and it's on a volunteer basis and they can believe whatever they like. The fact of the matter is, is that at the end of the day, you have to come to grips with origins. Did you come about as the result of creative design by somebody that created and made you and put all this design in our creation? Or do you believe that you were the result of an accident? You know, I mean, a primordial ooze, an explosion, you know, good luck, some of these guys talk about. It's absolutely insanity. And I tell them, I mean, quite honestly, even if I wasn't a Christian, if I didn't believe the Bible, if I didn't follow the Bible, I wouldn't believe in that nonsense. 
I mean, you know, even some of these guys, they talk about life from another planet, you know, sperm missiles and all kinds of different stuff. I mean, something, but to t tell you or tell me that all this design came from nothing, intelligence came from nothing, that's got to be the, 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 the grandest lie that anybody's ever believed, and yet it swallowed hook, line, and sinker. With regard to this fourth uh, type of symbiotic relationship I referred to, it's, it's really a situation where it's a competition. And this is where, for example, uh, the best example would be like sponges and coral. They're competing in a situation for the same food supply, but in their competition, they actually give balance to the reef. And if they didn't have that competition, something would be out of whack. And so it's a competitive situation, but again, it's part of God's design. Oh boy. First example of mutualism, the relationship between a clownfish and a sea anemone. The sea anemone is a stationary organism, it has powerful poison stinging cells that are able to paralyze a curious uh, fish that comes by to visit and actually becomes the meal. The anemone has the capacity to draw that paralyzed fish in. It's got a mouth and it'll actually eat it. But the clownfish can swim among the poison laced tentacles without any harm. How? Because the stinging cells, which by the way, they're called nematocles. <laughs> and they release toxins. <laughs> When a small fish touches, just touches those tentacles, it becomes paralyzed and is able to be you know, taken in and eaten. Wow, fantastic. But yeah, but how does the clownfish survive? The poison toxins that kill the little fish. The clownfish secretes a substance in its mucus covering their bodies that suppresses the firing of nematocics. It's a hard word. N-E-M-A-T-O-C-Y-S-T-S. -E you figure it out. <clears throat> How does it safely swim between those tentacles? It's because of that mucus that had to be designed that covers its skin and allows it to swim effortlessly and without harm. So the clownfish definitely is protected by the sea anemones, toxic tentacles, but what's the sea anemone get out of the deal? Well, do you remember how brightly colored the clownfish is? He attracts all kinds of other fish looking for a meal, or maybe they're just curious. These are fish that would otherwise just swim by and pay no attention to the anemone, but they're drawn in by the flurry of color and movement. It's almost as if you know, they've been you know, lulled into a false security, if you will. Curious, unsuspecting fish comes in and becomes a meal for the sea anemone. And then, boom, oh, oh, oh. Other example includes the red-billed oxpecker who has a, you know, uh, impala, I guess, for a friend. So anyways, he, he perches himself on the impala's neck, snatches ticks from the ears of its host. And by the way, there's other animals. I mean, he's cleaning the ears out of, uh, you know, of this particular creature, but there's other animals like the buffalo, for example. This is the Cape buffalo. Well, he's got some similar problems. Now imagine if you had somebody to pick your nose for you. <laughs> but evolution would never produce this. Nope, not at all. Some animals cannot survive without their mutual friends. The bacteria in the gut of many animals is a perfect example. The protozoa, the bacteria in the gut. I mentioned earlier about a termite. A termite cannot convert cellulose to sugar. So the termite could eat, again, wood nonstop. It would still starve to death. But with the protozoa, that bacteria specially designed in the gut, the termite can convert the food, digest it, and the protozoa in this same process gets fed. Bacteria also breaks down the cellulose eaten by vegetarians, like cows and elephants. Big animals, they would starve to death. I mean, they have to have it. It's absolutely fabulous, really, the whole design. And then if that's not enough, you got this guy here, the, the Nile crocodile. He opens his mouth wide, and then the spur-winged plover flies in and out to feed on the parasites around its teeth. 
Got to give you a side note, though. If you don't know too much about the Nile crocodile, he's cranky. He's aggressive. I mean, it's literally a killing machine. 20 feet long, 1,600 pounds, territorial, opportunist. And here you got a little bird, toot, 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 climbs in to pick the stuff out of his teeth. How would that ever, how would that ever come about by, you know, happenstance? God programmed that behavior and that awareness in both animals that are involved. And by the way, it would never evolve. Never. That is just unbelievable. Oh boy. So what we got here is we got the green moray eel. In other words, uh, you know, uh, if you don't know about the moray eel, they're another one. They are super aggressive. Uh, you know, they're almost like if they were, if it was a land animal, it would be considered an apex hunter. These things, they, they kill everything. All right. So he's got a shrimp. I mean, a shrimp is a tasty morsel. No sound here, so don't worry. It's just, it's just beautiful to watch. Open wide. He goes so deep, I think he's cleaning his tonsils. <laughs> look at this, look at this. He disappears, boom. Look at this. Oh, thank you very much. We have a scientist here. There's a second set of teeth that he went after. Thank you very much. Look at this. That's amazing. Now, you may say, well, hey, they, you know, they get this free dental care, free dentist hygiene. Well, you know. You could probably do the same if you... Oh, there you go. You guys with the cookies back there, you might need this. Now, there's a second diver. Wait till he gets in there. He must have a lot of stuff in his teeth. When do you see how they, these shrimp get after this guy? Oh, look at him. <laughs> this is a, you know, a name, a four-part name. Colombian lesserback tarantula and his friend, the dotted humming frog. So the main part of the tarantula's diet is frogs. Oh, they love frogs, but not this frog. <laughs> I mean, this is stuff that only God could do. It's, it is so amazing. So various insects and ants are attracted to the burrow of the tarantula because after the tarantula gets done sucking the, you know, the juices out of various animals and leaves the carcass, there's all kinds of insects and ants that want to come and you know, get the leftovers. So it creates a real problem with these leftovers. And then not only that, but the tarantula's laying his eggs and whatnot. Well, wouldn't you know it? The tarantula happens to need a housekeeper and the frog happens to need some protection and something to eat and creates a beautiful symbiotic relationship because the dotted humming frog has a voracious appetite for everything that the tarantula leaves behind. And the tarantula, again, uh, keeps a insect-free little home, free of the predators, and gets the place cleaned up. The frog gets plenty of food, protection, and everybody's happy and blessed. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so our dear brother uh, made reference to that report which he sent me, Mr. Dave. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was a really great report. Uh, I decided to include a, a quote from that report because I thought, boy, it was so fitting. The title of that report was uh, Mutualism Defeats Natural Selection. And then there was this quote simply says this, Charles Darwin said, if it could be proved that any part of the structure of any one species had been formed for the exclusive good of another species, it would annihilate my theory, for such could not have been produced through natural selection. Nearly 80% of all plants with roots systems participate in a symbiotic relationship called mycor uh, mycorrhiza. In this relationship, the fungi will give nutrients to the plant in exchange for food. In laboratories, scientists found that the fungi would absorb extra minerals when they were plentiful and release them into the root of the plant when the minerals are scarce. 
This proves that some organisms were formed for the good of another species. The fungus doesn't keep the minerals for itself, but it gives it to the tree. According to Darwin, this would annihilate my theory, for such could not have been produced through natural selection." End quote. And then I added a quote from Charles Darwin here as well. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. And again, I think of the complexity of these relationships and some of what's involved. And again, every which way you look, it's the actual design. It's this very specific design that screams of the need of a creator. It would not happen by happenstance. Some examples of commensalism. This is the relationship, for example, between barnacles and humpback whales, or should I say humpback whales and barnacles. This is a relationship in which one animal lives with, on, or in. That's the idea of this, this whole idea of commensalism. Another animal also referred to as its host. The host neither benefits or is harmed by the relationship. It is completely one-sided in benefit, but at least the one half isn't harmed. Different types of barnacles attach themselves to the skin of whales. The huge whales do not appear to be bothered by the hitchhikers. The barnacles, however, benefit greatly. Because what happens is, is the whale becomes a transport mechanism, a, a bus, if you will, a, you know, a jet plane to some real rich, plankton-rich waters, in which case both the whale and the barnacles have plenty of microorganisms to feast on, a banquet, if you will. And so it's a beautiful thing for the barnacles, tr free transportation, and they eat themselves silly. Plans uh, commensalism can either be a brief interaction or it can be a long-lived relationship. There's other types of commensalism. You have uh, situations like uh, a golden jackal in the vultures, you know, waiting for an opportunity to feed on some freshly killed or an aged carcass. There's a lot of scavengers that are out, you know, in the fields, or I, I should say the, the, um, the jungles in these different areas, and they leave a lot behind, especially the apex hunters. They're, they're really sloppy eaters. They leave a lot behind. The lions, the tigers, they clean up the scraps behind them. The thing you need to understand why this becomes extraordinarily important is because in the case of the jackal, they have this somewhat unusual... I guess I'm going to call it a, uh, a living arrangement. What would you call it? Within the groups, within the, the pack, or however you want to call it, if you are not participating properly or do something that get yourself on the outs with the pack, they throw you out. It happens much more often than people realize. Jackals are one of a number of groups of animals that can only hunt as a pack. By themselves, they are completely vulnerable to all kinds of other animals, and they're not fast enough, ferocious enough to be able to feed themselves. They would cease to exist, the ones that are thrown out of the pack. So what they've learned to do is, like in the case of the golden jackal, it will literally, the rest of its life after it's been disowned by the pack, it will trail and track, not too close, behind, for example, the tiger and it'll pick up the scraps after they've been done feeding. They will shadow the hunter. It's the only way they'll survive. And so again, another example of commensalism. And then there's the, also the example, of course, oh boy, the parasites, I call it the fallen list, you know, part of the fall, oh boy. You know, in, uh, in parasitism, it's, it's, it's a harmful symbiotic relationship. This is where the the parasitic organism lives with, on, or in the host at the animal's expense, the expense of the host. Now, quite often, or most often, the host doesn't die, but typically the host is impacted in a negative way. It impacts their health. Sometimes the illnesses can lead to death, but in any event, it does harm and destroy the health. And so this is why it's a separate category. It's, a, eh, it's a definitely a, a category formed after the curse. 
some ocean examples are nematodes, leeches, and barnacles. Oh, yes, you heard me say barnacles. You see, a barnacle can be both commensalistic and parasitic. When it comes to the whale, because of its size, it's commensalistic. But when you introduce these parasites, these barnacles, to something like a, a crab, a swimming crab, it destroys their life. And so again, it's kind of flip-flops in both categories, if you will. I also refer to this as my list again of these, these fallen. This would have been the result of the sin that came into the world. Romans 8.22 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. And so creation, God's creation, it knows that things are off track. It knows that things are, are, are not correct. And so this is why you have this situation. What are some other examples of those that would be on the fallen list? Fleas, ticks, mosquitoes, tapeworms, head lice, parasitic wasps, bed bugs, mites, aphids. It's a scary bunch, I tell you. Whew. Oh boy. Now, this is fun. Let's switch gears just a little tiny bit. These are some other outrageous examples of uh, you know, some of these relationships. Emerald Lagasse, if you're familiar with him, you know, he's the cook. He's the cook. He has this famous expression where he'll say, let's kick it up a notch. <laughs> so why don't we? Why don't we kick it up a notch? <laughs> Madagascar star orchid and Darwin's hawk moth. This, to me, is one of the most outrageous examples of a mutual relationship between a plant and an animal. So we were talking about animals, now we're a plant and an animal. The Madagascar star orchid is one powerful argument for special creation. It has an extremely long nectar tube, which if you look at my picture there, the slide kind of tells a story. It, this would never evolve, this is so insane. It's like 12 inches, 30 centimeters long. In order to be pollinated, one of God's creatures is going to need to be equipped with about a 12 or 13 inch drilling rig. <laughs> you might call it a tongue. But this guy, man, he's going deep. That is one long tongue. Now, you need to keep in mind at this point that God has created at least 15,000 species of butterflies, 150,000 different species of moths, that's not to mention other types of pollinators like bees and other, you know, some other animals. And so maybe out of, say, an estimated 250,000, a quarter of a million pollinators on planet Earth, just one type, one moth, has the right equipment to pollinate the star orchid. No backup. That's a God thing, okay? Oh, yes, it is. Nicknamed Darwin's hawk moth, the scientific name is uh, Xanthropan morganae. Darwin may have discovered the plant, but he had to kind of imagine about the animal that would do the pollinate because in his lifetime it hadn't been discovered. He didn't know anything about the, the moth. He just concluded that surely there must be something that can pollinate it. And granted, you know, yeah, it's alive, it had to get pollinated. It was many years later, the moth was discovered, proving that there, sure enough, had been a, a pollinator with special design. God's one-off, a wrench, if you will, in the whole teaching of evolution. Full disclosure, there's a debate over the moth's name. In the 1860s, another evolutionary scientist worked with Charles Darwin. His name was Russell Wallace. They both marveled at the creature that could possibly reach the plant's syrup treasure buried deep in the nectar tube. Some books and uh, papers credit the discovery of the moth to Darwin. Others give credit to Russell Wallace, referring to the moth as you know, Wallace's spink moth, or again, the Darwin's moth. Ah, oh, boy. So I guess you can decide if you prefer giving, you know, the credit, you know, Darwin's hawk moth or Wallace's spink moth. Let me give you my two cents. 
man fights over who gets the credit for the discovery of the marvels of nature. I'm more interested in the one who designed and created the marvelous wonders that they discover. Amen? Amen? Yeah. The Lord Jesus, he's something, ain't he? Romans 1.20, it says, for creation, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what he has made so that man is without excuse. This uh, particular quote happens to come from Albert Einstein, not Darwin, but it goes to show you, you know, big thinkers in their days, and to really let some air out in a balloon of those that really misrepresent, lie, bluff, and just are pretty much involved in uh, chicanery. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've ran into individuals I was speaking to about creation versus evolution, and they were taught that Albert Einstein was an atheist. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah, no, he was no atheist. His whole problem was that he couldn't imagine, get his mind around the idea that a God so big to create all that he understood from, you know, the world at an elementary particle level, that a God so big, so powerful, so great, that he could also be a personal God. As Christians and as people that follow Christ, of course, we're able to make that connection and, and latch on to that belief. But, I mean, the quote itself is so fabulous. Gentlemen, the deeper I delve into the science, sciences of this universe, the more firmly do I believe that one God or force or influence has organized all of it for our discovery. He saw order and symmetry that is referred to as mathematical elegance, but he could never comprehend that a God so great could also be our personal God. It's a sad little detail, but nonetheless, it does demonstrate again that even these big thinkers, they look at things at an elementary particle level or they look at the world maybe as far as ast astronomy or sciences just in the complexities of uh, biology and there's so many things that they just cannot explain. All it takes is opening their heart and of course they'd find out the, the answer. There's a lot of uh, incredible facts about moths. We just covered a moth, and although not specifically to do with the symbiotic relationships, we can just take a little side path here for about a minute and tell you a couple of things that you'll find interesting, okay? Um, do you know that there's a lot of large moths and that many of those moths, as adults, don't eat? The uh, adult phase of their life cycle is very short, literally days. They have just one purpose in their adult stage of life, and that is to mate and lay eggs. Uh, one example is this beautiful guy here, the Luna or the Moon Moth. During its short adult life, the Luna or the uh, Moon Moth lives entirely off food stored in its body that was stored up during the caterpillar stage, the larva. Just as a reminder, the moon moth undergoes a four-stage life cycle, typical of most moths, the egg, the larva, or the caterpillar, the pupa, cocoon, and then the adult. The whole life cycle spans just seven to eight weeks, the whole thing total, from egg to adult. The adult lays the egg under a leaf. It hatches in about a week. The caterpillar, man, full-on pig out and uh, vegetation and reaches three inches pretty quick. I mean, it's all out. Full size in just two to three weeks, it spins, a, a, a spins silk to form a cocoon for its pupil stage, which also lasts two to three weeks. And then finally, the adult moth emerges and lives for approximately one week. That's right, seven days. Seven days it mates and lays its eggs before it dies. Diet of the caterpillar, uh, it was leaves from a walnut or a hickory tree. Sometimes it's a sweet gum tree. And uh, just so you understand it, you know, it's not by happenstance, but by design. The adult doesn't have a mouth. I mean, it's formed without a mouth. There is no mouth. It's not going to need one. God designed it that way. It's God's system. It's absolutely mind-boggling, really. Ants and aphids. Oh, my, my, my. This is... This is kicking up. There's about 4,000 species of aphids. The mama aphids, boy, they are 
quite efficient. They can lay 50 eggs, and the young in that brood of 50 eggs will begin to give birth themselves in 10 days. Now, what you need to understand about my kind of dramatizing that little detail is if you know anything about exponential growth, yeah. you would quite quickly realize that if there wasn't some kind of balance built into nature by God with the use of you know, different insects, including spiders and frogs and birds and just all kinds of different animals to create a balance, pretty soon the whole planet would be clogged up with aphids, if you will. No question about it. Aphids, a.k.a. plant lice, is what they really are. They're a soft-bodied bug that sucks the sap out of plants. They're a parasite. The byproduct of these aphids sucking the sap out of the plants is something that we call honeydew. And that's what we want to look at a little bit, the honeydew. It's not a honeydew list, it's a honeydew for eating. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I know what you're thinking. So the aphids suck the sap as a food source, and then the waste part that is discharged is its much sought after, it's very tasty, it's a food source for certain types of ants. The ants know how to stimulate the production of this honeydew, kind of akin to farmers that manage milk cows. You know, they milk their cows. And the ants are able to do the same. Matter of fact, they'll actually remove the wings on some of these aphids. They'll put them in little groups and batches and, I mean, corral them up. I mean, just like a farmer with his, with his cows. It's no kidding. Really, no, hardly any difference at all, really. And then this quote from a book entitled Discovering Ants. It's a quote now. The aphids produce partially digested sap from their rear ends. This is a sweet mixture of sugars called honeydew, which ants love, end quote. I mean, if you didn't say, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic, really. And you think God doesn't have a sense of humor. Oh, boy, are you wrong. <laughs> ants sometimes take aphids into their, their nests where they may, you know, lay their eggs which then the ants will care for, like little babysitters. And uh, the thing of it is, is some of those aphids will never see the light of day. They keep them underground. You say, well, where do they get the, uh, the honeydew? Where do they, they get the sap? Roots. They have them where they're able to suck the sap out of the roots instead of off the leaves, and they keep them right there in their burrow. It's a crazy setup. They bring them right into the nest. They have them right there with them. Uh, when the eggs, uh, let's see. When the eggs open, the young aphids are raised to be milked. That's it. That's their whole life. Just like the older ones, some aphids never see the light of day. The, they feed on the roots of the plants. And the ants also build shelters on the ones that are on the leaves to protect the aphids. They actually uh, you know, herd them and manage them, just like a farmer does with his cows. The ants also protect the aphids from predators like spiders and and ladybugs. And again, farmers, they build cattle sheds in the fields and they protect their herds. It's the same thing. Now, when we talk about food storage, this is another, like, I mean, again, not directly involved with the symbiotic relationship per se, but when you think about the ants and the eating and the efficiencies and, and then the need for storage, this, this whole thing, the honeydew ants, this, this becomes a whole other interesting little detail. Now, you might remember from Darwin's uh, quote about things, if, if it could be demonstrated at certain types of features in animals, that you know, if, if you couldn't account for how it would form by successive mutations, boom, boom, boom. You look at that thing with that valve system, the force feeding it of the ant to get it to you know, like create like a 55-gallon you know, drum there to store the stuff. I mean, the whole thing is so absolutely mind-boggling. See, God does it because he can. Evolution, it's, it's, it's such a lie. It's, it's, it, what frustrates me so much is it's been so powerfully uh, taught to these students, these uh, young people, generations of young people, and they believe it. I mean, they, they believe it. They, they don't recognize any of the design in nature. It's 
one of the reasons why I like focus on the nature and then bringing it back to the Bible and saying, look, this is our creator. And listen, this stuff here wasn't of first importance to the Lord. We are of first importance to the Lord. He did it to demonstrate his power in design, the fact that he's a powerful, awesome, loving creator, designer, and ultimately our savior. Amen? The honeydew is, uh, is of great value to the ants, and so the ants, again, have different ways of storing the honeydew. But I'm especially uh, impressed as to the ants' efficiency in collecting, eating, and, uh, you know, again, just the way they manage their whole uh, lifestyle, if you will. One writer said plainly, the ants lap the stuff up right from their rear ends. Some is eaten on the spot and some taken back to the nest and fed to the queen and larva, mouth to mouth. Again, another direct quote from uh, Funk and Wagnall's encyclopedia. An important note is, is that the aphids, unattended by ants, get rid of the honeydew to waste by flicking it. They flick it off, and that's their normal routine. But here's a quote that will shed some more light on the whole, you know, design by God. Um, this, again, this is from Funk and Wagnall, Wildlife Encyclopedia. Uh, I believe this... Boom, yeah, right here. Under stimulation from an ant, however, the aphid does not discard the fluid with the flick or of its hind leg, but allows the ant to remove it and goes on doing so, seeming to enjoy the caressings of the ant's antenna. Under continued stimulation, very large quantities of honeydew may be produced. So this, I mean, this really amps up the production. I mean, again, they're loving it. The, the, the aphids are, are really into it. So another benefit to the aphids, this is in the Encyclopedia of the uh, Animal World, 1972. It says, the honeydew collected by the ants is a food surplus to the green fly's requirements, which it exudes from its anus. Uh, ants habit of keeping black fly colonies clean by removing uh, removal of the honeydew has been demonstrated to increase the reproductive rate of the aphids, end quote. When not attended by the ants, the honeydew gathers around the aphids, become infected by fungi and other microorganisms, and reduces the aph aphids' reproductive potential. Put plainly, the ants wipe clean the aphids behind and get a sweet, tasty, nutritious meal in exchange. Our Lord is not only a genius in his creation, but he is also a great, he has a great sense of humor. Okay. And then we have to just a little look-see here. How large a, oh, this is a, this is a good little uh, detail here. How large a quantity can be collected? One large aphid can produce nearly two cubic millimeters an hour, and a colony of common ants can collect an estimated three to six pounds of honeydew in a hundred days. It's, that's just, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy example of, of efficiencies, okay? Now, <clears throat> special relationship between ants and plants. So we went from animals to animals, animals and plants, and then with the plants and, and well, now we're going to ants and plants specifically. This is, this is another, this is, Plants including trees, bushes, shrubs, and uh, you know, other such types of the creation actually have enemies. They might be pests like insects or enemies like large animals that eat their leaves and you know, attack the plants. And so you know, we don't often look at it that way, but plants also have enemies and have problems. Some plants may have thorns to protect themselves from larger animals munching on them. Some of them might have poison leaves to give them protection. But that's no protection against a small insect. Thorns, although they don't uh, provide any protection for the small pests like insects, do serve a purpose. There are some plants that have and they actually need ants for their protector, their protection. So an example would be in Central America, there's acacia trees. They have hollow 
thorns that attract a certain kind of ant that makes their home in those thorns. Now, stop and think. <coughs> How would it be that the particular acacia tree would just happen to form a particular type of a thorn with a certain type of bulbous base that happens to be used by, see, you got to be thinking outside, you know, thinking deeply as I go over these details because it would never evolve. The whistling thorn acacia has huge bulbous swellings at the base of the thorns. And again, if you look at the pictures, you'll see everything I'm describing. They're filled with a soft pitch that's easily removed. The acacia tree also provides two kinds of food that are the favorites with certain ants. Just dumb luck, you think? Or the result of an awesome creator. Special outgrowths among the leaves also provide nectar from the leaf stalks, nourishing oil, and protein. Everything the ant needs. One stop. Some food is eaten on the spot and extra collected and taken to their nests. Wow, the ant receives food and shelter from the acacia. In return, the ants provide protection. The ants can drive, uh, can deliver a powerful sting to browsing animals. And if a single ant is attacked, it can send out a call for help by squirting out a special alarm scent that rallies many other workers and soldiers to its rescue. Note that there are many aphids in the tropics. Um, uh, pardon me, that's not correct. Uh, the problem is there are not many aphids in the tropics, but there are ants that like honeydew. And so those particular ants, they go after tree hoppers. They don't have the aphids, but they have the tree hoppers. The tree hoppers are kind of a big animal, but this is an interesting little detail. So in the tropics, they're getting, on, uh, getting after these tree hoppers, and because of the personal care and the protection that the ants provide, it is so good, and the tree hopper mothers know it's good, that they will leave their young way sooner than normal if the ants are in the area. Babysitters, and they recognize it. It's fantastic. It's written about in a book entitled Bugs and Insects, <clears throat> And it says that it refers to this whole symbiotic relationship. It talks about commando style babysitters. <laughs> yeah, that's a direct quote commando style babysitters. Uh, one more interesting fact here about the ants' relationship with the plants. One study confirmed that if the ants are removed from the trees, the tree comes under attack from lots of enemy insects and will destroy the health of the tree. Another beautiful example of this. Mutualistic relationship. Pardon me. <coughs> God's word is sweet. Now the ants, they've discovered the sweetness of the honeydew. We sometimes understand the sweetness of honey. We, we know about sweets. We like sweets. There's a, a wonderful woman, uh, Della Letkamin, that was a, a Christian missionary from uh, Equator. She wrote a book entitled Amazing Ants. And her whole focus was on the fact of looking at, again, the ants, their, their, their whole life system kind of built around, you know, going after this honeydew, going after this sweetness, and then kind of comparing it to what we see in the scripture with regard to what God's desire for us is to have a desire for his word that would be akin, that we would have that desire. See, so it's not just, it's not just words. God wants us to have that affinity. We take and have that kind of a love and a, a, a draw to his word. And so Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Psalm 119, 103, eat honey, my son, for it is good. Honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. Know also that wisdom is sweet to your soul. If you find that there is a future hope for you and your hope will not be cut off, Proverbs 24, 13 to 14, it's absolutely beautiful. I have uh, one last little treat for you. I look, I, I actually look at the audience when I'm out and um, message went on for a few minutes, you know, and uh, you've been very good. I want to actually talk to you about one more, I don't know if it can be classified as a symbiotic relationship, probably not scientifically, but it's what I would classify as an unlikely relationship. Unlikely, very unlikely. 
And I would say that, I'll say it now, and I may say it when it's done, but it kind of shows you, I mean, part of the whole reason I'm showing this is there's, a, there's kind of a, an underlying thought, which I'll share with you when I'm done. But uh, uh, here we go. I, I believe God's message there would be to never give up hope. The Lord does some amazing things in our lives, in the world, in nature. And um, we're the crown of God's creation. He loves these animals. He's put the behavior in them. But you stop and you think of his love for us and that he died on the cross for us. And you start to understand and, and get a, you know, somewhat of an idea of how important what we do with the information that we're given, how important that is. We can look at all kinds of examples in nature and biology and the sciences, relationships of animals, but if we miss the underlying, what's the most important part of the message, it's all for naught. God's looking forward to the day that he wants all of us to come to him so that we might walk on streets of gold one day with him and be his, be his children, be with him in his house, in the Father's house. He wants us with him. And so uh, we can look at these things and be touched. But if we haven't trusted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then we need to be moved to do it. Salvation is as simple as ABC. I didn't come to know the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior until I was 27 years old. I grew up in a God-fearing, God-believing home. I went to church uh, for most of that time. I believed that uh, Jesus uh, you know, um, died on the cross. Uh, I believe he was resurrected. We, you know, we, we remember that Easter. I believed that he was born a miraculous birth. I believed all of that before I got saved. You might believe all that. I didn't confess my sin to the Lord Jesus and ask him personally to be my savior until I was 27 years old. That's what informs me with, uh, about the importance of not taking anything for granted. You could be here, you could be a God-fearer, you're loving God, you believe in Jesus, but there has to be a time in your life where you, A, you agree with God that you're a sinner and B, that you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty, not for the world, sins of the world, we know that, but for you personally, you have to make it personal. And that C, in confessing Jesus, especially before men, with a witness, you know, confess Jesus before men, that that's the way of salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes in the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And I'm just going to pray for you right now. <clears throat> Dear Lord, I thank you for being a good, a faithful, a loving Lord and Savior, and I pray that if there be any here that's never put their trust in you, that they would pray that simple prayer, and maybe they'd pray it along with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I know that I've been separated from you by my sin. But I also believe what your word says that you, Lord Jesus, you went to that cross and you died to pay my penalty. I ask you, Lord Jesus, come into my life, be my personal Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins and help me live my life for you, Lord. And I'll never be ashamed of the one that died for me. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. Amen.